So my name is Jeff Halper, um, and as usual, I'm speaking to the converted, so I know half the audience, so I feel right at home. Um, and I'm the head of the, uh, a group called the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, as Ellen said, uh, which is an Israeli um, political organization. Uh, we started in 1997 when the Oslo peace process was, was in a, a, a state of collapse. Rabin had been assassinated, uh, Netanyahu had been elected the first time, and uh, we in the Israeli peace movement wanted to re-engage in resisting the occupation. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we wanted to do that, but you know, occupation is a very abstract, kind of a concept, even for Israelis, <laughs> who are about as removed from it as you are here. And uh, so we focus on the issue of house demolitions, you know, after talking to our Palestinian partners, because this is one of the most painful parts of the occupation. Uh, Israel has demolished, until today, about 55,000 Palestinian homes in the occupied territories. Um, but, you know, we have to remember that this is on the backdrop of probably 60,000 homes that were demolished in the Nakba in 1948 and in years after in a very systematic way, um, plus thousands of more houses inside Israel until today of Palestinians, Bedouins are being demolished. There's one famous community you might know in the, in the Negev that's called al Arakib, which has been demolished about 120 times already and rebuilt by the residents and with support from uh, Israeli activists. So, <clears throat> so uh, you know, we've been doing that work for many years. And for many years, uh, the end game was clear. And that was the two-state solution. We supported the two-state solution, even though it wasn't a just and fair solution, but we supported that because the Palestinians had accepted that. You know, Arafat and the PLO in 1988 accepted the two-state solution. Um, so I'm not going to be more Catholic than the Pope. <laughs> and it was good enough for Arafat, it was good enough for me. And that was our program for many years, and the whole point of our resisting house demolitions and working on the issue of house demolitions was to expose how the occupation works, what Israel's intentions are, and of course the human suffering that's a part of the occupation. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, when the two-state solution died, you know, everybody has a different cutoff point. There are some among us, like J Street people, we think it's still alive. I mean, people are clinging on to it. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think for at least 10 years. Well, that's what I want to talk about tonight, partly is that there was never a two-state option. I mean, it was never an actual political plan or an actual option. But it was clear that it was dead uh, at least a decade ago. And the problem then is that you can't be in a political struggle without an end game. You know, in South Africa, where many of us of my generation were involved in the anti-apartheid struggle, you know, everything we did over the years always had an end game that was one person, one vote. That was the program, that was the plan, that was the bottom line. So we all knew what we were BDSing for in those days, what we were, what we were struggling for. Today, we have a very vibrant movement against the occupation, let's say. That's become a slogan, end the occupation. I'm gonna argue tonight that I don't think there is an occupation. I think we should stop using that term. But that's, you know, so we, and we have all kinds of slogans. We're doing BDS and we're doing this campaign and that campaign. And we have organizations do very good work, but all without an end game. What do we want? What's our plan? What's our vision? Um, and you can't be a political player without without an end game. So over the last, um, 
over the last year and a half, a number of us, I would say a core group of about 50 Palestinians, mainly from within Israel, many connected to the Balad party, if you know Balad Tejamo, which is the Arab nationalist party in Israel that was founded by Azmi Bashara. Um, but many academics and intellectuals and many young people uh, are part of it, but also Palestinians from the territories and from abroad and from the camps. Together with maybe 25 or 30 Israeli Jews, um, and we've spent the last year and a half trying to formulate a program of a one-state solution. In other words, a new political program that we can actually bring forward as a political program. And I have a copy of it here. I'm going to talk about it tonight, but we can pass it around if you'd like. Um, and we have the, pro it's a 10-point program. But what's interesting is on the back, we have in, in the beginning, we're going to launch in April. We haven't launched this campaign. We call it the one, uh, the one Democratic State campaign. We're going to launch it in April. Um, but you know, one of the questions is, who are we? Who do you represent? We have to show people that we actually represent a meaningful voice. So we've begun by getting people to endorse our program, Palestinians and Israelis. So you'll see on this list so far, I mean, now we have several hundred names. But until this was published a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, we had about 150 names. And you'll recognize some of them, Palestinians and Israelis, although many of them are more local people, more community people, younger people that you won't, that you won't know. So let me just... Um, you just pass this around. I mean, not, you know, just pass it around. And this. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, this is an important issue to deal with. I'm not going to get into, into that. But um, the book that I have, actually, it's, I guess it's for sale in the back, War Against the People, you know, I, we've been, I've been working on this issue of Palestine with others, of course, for many years. Um, and the issue itself is important. It's an important issue to deal with because it destabilizes the entire Middle East. But it also has a global aspect to it. I'm not going to get into that tonight. That's what the, the war against the people is about. But what I'm really trying to argue is that Israel is, is exporting the occupation. It's, you know, uh, the occupation, the occupied, what we call the occupied territories, are essentially a laboratory in which Israel develops and perfects weapon systems, security systems, surveillance systems, tactics of population control, what I call technologies of repression. Um, and in the end, what it's really exporting is the concept of a security state where you can be a democracy, like Israel claims to be a democracy, but everything is subordinated to security. And this is a whole model, and, and you know, JVP, uh, that's one of the groups sponsoring tonight's talk, has a program called Deadly Exchange, that is uh, trying to document uh, Israeli involvement in the, in the American police forces, security forces, that's very important. Um, but uh, beyond that, you know, Israel is really trying to sell a new concept in a way called the security state. So all I'm saying is that the, the Palestinian issue, I call this global Palestine. Um, because the Palestinian issue, in a sense, Israel over Palestine is a microcosm of the global north over the global south. And by looking at how Israel, now we're not talking about you know, just an occupation or a, or a, a short-term repression. We're talking about 50 years, or you could actually say 70 years, or you could almost, you could say more than a century uh, of, Israel, of an Israeli war against the Palestinian people. So at a time when the United States is trying to, is, is arming itself to fight a war against the Soviet Union, and Europe hasn't fought colonial wars for 50, 60, 70 years. 
um, I, put, I put my global palace and idea within the framework of global capitalism. So that as neoliberalism, which is now about 50 years old, um, begins to close down more and more, and more people are excluded, um, there's more resistance. You have the Occupy movement here. There's all kinds of forms of resistance, both in the global south and in the global north. And therefore, wars against the people become the new kind of warfare. You don't have any more wars of countries against each other and ideologies and armies and tanks and things like that. You know, it's interesting, the last, the last conventional war that involved two or more major powers was Korea. You know, there have been local wars since then, Israel, Arab wars, uh, uh, the Falkland War, that was a cute war, Iran, Iraq, but they were more localized and, and, uh, and fairly short. They were deadly, but they were fairly shorter in, 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 in scope. This kind of a war against the people that Israel's been waging, again, is more than a century old. So that Israel has become the go-to place for elites, corporations, governments, um, that have an interest in repressing their populations. Uh, so that what I'm trying to argue in the book is, you know, it's very nice to, and it's important, that we identify with Palestinians, and Palestinian human rights and the political issue, but we shouldn't look at this as a far away issue of another people far away, because it's coming home. When Israel attacks Gaza, in the disproportionate way it does. There's no relation between the amount of force Israel uses and the actual military threat. In fact, it's experimenting with new types of weaponry that I, in my book, I, I describe the new kinds of weapons used for the first time in Gaza and in the West Bank in many, in many cases. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but the Gazans aren't the point. The Palestinians aren't the point. The Palestinians, it, it's harsh to say this, but the Palestinians are the guinea pigs. They're the ones that are being experimented on. You have to look at the occupied territory as a resource for Israel, a country that has a laboratory that it can do anything it wants to, literally, to Palestinians without any threat of sanctions, um, that is then exporting the occupation. This is, this is the point. Israel, you know, uh, is the fourth largest nuclear power in the world. It's the sixth largest arms exporter. Israel, you know, we think of Israel as, we love the United States, the United States loves us. Uh, Trump mentioned uh, Israel yesterday. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister speaks before Congress every couple years, a love affair. Well, if you all of a sudden put security into the picture, and one thing I, I, by the way, I wrote a book about something I know nothing about. Really, I couldn't tell you a grenade from a, from a tank. But what I discovered was that if you take the military and homeland security and policing, which is today one package, it's come together really as one thing. Globally, it's a two and a half trillion dollar a year industry. Whoa. So I'm saying to myself, I'm an activist, I'm a leftist, I'm political, and I don't know anything about a two and a half trillion dollar a year industry that's based on violence and control and repression? Whoa, that's a pretty big blind spot. So that once you put that into the equation, it changes the entire international system. And all of a sudden, friends and enemies and allies all become uh, confused. One example, because I don't want to, I'm not, I'm getting too much into this stuff. I get dragged into it. Um, you know, how much Israel loves the U.S. and U.S. loves Israel. We see Israel as a client state of the U.S. or vice versa. Depends how you, but look, it turns out Israel is the number two arms supplier to China. Whoa. That's after Russia. It's pretty impressive for a state the size of Connecticut, you know? And uh, last week, and it was in the newspaper, John Bolton was in Israel. 
And Bolton says, and it was part of the headline, Bolton says, if Trump ever found out <laughs> you know, how close Israel is to China, he'd be very upset. <laughs> you know, Israel's the number two arms supplier to India. Netanyahu is now the star of Brazil with Bolsonaro, you know, and is beginning to sell drones with facial recognition technologies to the Brazilian police. So this goes way, way beyond, I'm not gonna get into this tonight, simply Palestine. If you follow the threads out and follow the dollars out and the violence, what I wanna say is this, and this, I think, should be a key message of the BDS campaigns and of all our campaigns. And that is that as your police force and your security forces and your militaries to some degree are being Israelized, you, the people, are being Palestinianized. In other words, you have to look at this actually and literally like that. You know, the weaponry used against the people of Gaza the Gazans, again, are simply the middle people, the, 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 the guinea pigs. They're intended for you. The whole point of devel developing these weapon systems and technology systems is to sell them, to export them. So you're the ones on the receiving end, as much as the Palestinians. So that this is an issue that really should be of concern for us because of its global aspects that affect our lives, um, but also because unless you, under, you understand these relationships that are most, you know, it, it, you know, I could have written a book about the American military, but it's very unusual. You've got a Pentagon that has a budget of a trillion dollars. Nobody can match that, as Trump also said last night. But if you look at a small country like Israel that has to scramble, it has to sell, and has to find all kinds of ways of getting its technologies everywhere, that reveals the, you know, the way this whole system works much better than trying to look at a, at a superpower. So I would suggest to you that, that the Palestinian issue has implications for all of us way beyond Palestine itself. Okay, having said that, <laughs> obviously, um, we're concerned about resolving this issue, um, you know, between Israelis and Palestinians. So let's come back to that. Um, <clears throat> and what I want to suggest tonight is a whole different way of looking at this conflict. We call it a conflict. The Israel-Palestine conflict or the Israeli-Arab conflict. It's not a conflict. You know, and the words you use and the approach you take determines the conclusions you come to and the political programs that you just just. So, so it's very important to understand what's going on in the actual way. This is not a conflict. Are, are, are these weapons all being manufactured in Israel? No, some of them are being manufactured. Uh, the Israel weapon, just to, all right, okay. you're drawing me into all this. You know, one thing, the Israel weapons industry that makes the Uzi submachine gun, which is the most famous submachine gun in the world. It's used by mafia, by drug cartels, police, armies. Um, the Israel weapons uh, uh, industry just opened a manufacturing plant in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And they're taking, what they do is they take the military weaponry and they make it appropriate for law enforcement. That's, the, that's where they're going. So in other words, you take the Uzi submachine gun that isn't tremendously big anyway, but you hold it with two hands and you compact it into a pistol. You see, so the next time your local police stop you, I mean, they could be easily drawing an Uzi submachine gun out of their holsters and not simply a pistol. So all this military type weaponry that, um, that they specialize in, the Israel weapons industry, um, they're manufacturing not just for law enforcement, but for, you know, you've got 300 gun nuts in the United States. I mean, that's a pretty big market. So they've even got, um, they just had a, the largest arms show was just in Las Vegas. 
And it was filled with Israeli booths. All, and all the booths were manned by women. You know, that were soldiers that are carrying the guns, all the marketing like that. Well, they have a whole line, the Israel weapons industry, of automatic weapons for women. You know, that are in pink, and they're shaped, you know. And I, 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 in other words, Israel is very, very uh, good in terms of marketing this kind of stuff and getting it in. So this isn't only uh, weapon reproduced in Israel. All right, I, I'm not going to get into all that. Okay. So, going back to what we're talking about, what I'm saying here is that the terms we use are wrong. A conflict is between two sides, right? And the sides are roughly symmetrical, and, and uh, they disagree about something. And the way you resolve a conflict is the sides get together, they negotiate, you come to some kind of a compromise, and you resolved it. Well, that's not what's happening here. This is instead uh, an, uh, uh, an instance of settler colonialism. Just like the United States is. Um, but it's settler colonialism. In other words, it has to do with, with uh, settlers, you know, the Zionist settlers of 125 years ago and so on, coming to this country with the intention of taking it over. Now, they weren't immigrants <laughs> with the intention of integrating into the society. They had the intention of taking it over. And they, they're very clear about that. I mean, they said that very clearly. They saw this as the land of Israel. And it's all the land of Israel. It wasn't 78% of the country they were aspiring to. There was no green line. There was no occupation. And most important, there was no other side. You know, when the uh, white settlers came to the United States or to, to North America and began their process of displacing and eliminating the Native Americans, the Native Americans weren't another side. They weren't negotiating with them. They weren't, you know, uh, settler colonialism is unilateral. That's the thing to understand here. This is a unilateral process of taking over a country. And every settler colonial movement makes up a narrative. It makes up a story of why the settlers are entitled to that land rather than the indigenous. See, and the story usually has to do with God, somehow, you know? Well, here it's easy. You know, God gave us the land. I mean, trump that. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and the whole story of, um, you know, there was a revolt against Rome, and we lost, duh, you know? And we were, the Jews were exiled, and now we're coming back. It's a story. It never happened. Uh, there was never an exile. There's not one reputable historian, even Israeli, that has ever written about an exile. Romans never exiled people. They sold slaves, that's true, but they never exiled peoples. And in fact, what's interesting is that Almost immediately after the revolt, the country was devastated, that's true. But in the, in the century afterwards, the country flourished. That was when you had the emergence of what's called the Jerusalem Talmud, and very you know, famous Talmudic centers like Yavne and Sephoris and so on, Sipori in Hebrew. So that this whole story was made up. And, and I, I can tell you the man that made it up, Ben Zion Dinur who was the, one of the, fir the first Israeli uh, minister of education. And they made up this story. And the point of the story is, we're coming home, right, to a land that God gave us. It's our homeland exclusively. And, and this is the land of Israel. So that, in a sense, I'm not going to get into that whole history, but this issue of exclusivity is, is crucial. You know. Um, because you have that element until today. Um, in settler colonialism, there's no other side. In any case of settler colonialism, the indigenous are not your friends. You don't get along with them. Maybe in the first hour or two, you know, they save your life by teaching you how to grow something, and then you kill them. 
you know, they're not, they're not, um, there's no relationship between settlers and the indigenous people. And then you've got this whole issue of, of exclusivity because every settler group claims an exclusive. If you recognize the indigenous as a side or as a people with rights or that have some kind of claim to the land, you're undercutting your own claims. Then you have to deal with them. The way you eliminate them and displace them is simply by denying them any claim, any sense of agency. So that Zionism was based on three elements that did that together. One was the Bible. Well, you look at the Old Testament, look at the, you, you, know, one, you know where ISIS came from? Read the book of Joshua sometime. It's a book of genocide. And you have genocide all through the Old Testament. So there's an exclusive, God gave us this land, period. And you have strangers, you're supposed to be nice to strangers, but they're always strangers. They're never any, there's never any integration. And not only that, if they raise their heads, <laughs> like in the Bible, the people of Nablus do, you kill them. I mean, there's zero tolerance didn't begin with Giuliani, believe me. <laughs> so that's one, one element. The second element was um, ethnocracy. Israel presents itself as a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East. You hear this every day. And it looks like a democracy. You know, if you go to Israel, most people are kind of white. You know, it has a European standard of living. A lot, most people speak English. I mean, it looks Europeanish at least. But in fact, it's not an, a democracy. It's what we call an ethnocracy. An ethnocracy is when a country belongs to a particular people. And all you have to do is look at the Israeli flag and you can see that. In other words, in this country claimed by Zionism, the whole country, from the Mediterranean to the Jordan River, the flag represents one particular group with the Star of David, and that's a minority group. Because today, the Israeli Jews are a minority in this country. There already is a Palestinian majority, even before refugees return. Well, this comes out of Eastern Europe and Central Europe. You know, Germany before the end of World War II and Russia, I mean Russia, Poland, Hungary until today are ethnocracies. The belong, Russia belongs to the Russians. Hungary belongs to the Hungarians. Look at the way they're treating refugees from Syria that try to come in. It's xenophobia. So, the, so Israel is basically a transposition of Eastern European tribal nationalism into the Middle East. So actually Israel is much more similar to Poland or Hungary or Russia than it is to the United States. And that's where the exclusivity comes from. Because the idea is this, this is a, our country and it belongs to us exclusively. And the third element again is settler colonialism that has that same element that we talked about. So whether, so you have three elements that feed into Zionism, all of which have an exclusive claim to the country and all of which deny any claim or any the existence even, the collective existence of an indigenous people. So that the, then the whole process was taking over the country. And if there's one word that I would use to characterize the entire Zionist movement over the last 125 years, and it's a word we use in Israel, it's the word Judaization. It isn't a term we use very often. It doesn't have a legal reference like occupation or apartheid. But we're Judaizing the Galilee. That's an official Israeli government policy. We're Judaizing Jerusalem. And overall, the idea is, our goal is to Judaize the country. In other words, the goal is to turn an Arab country into a Jewish country. To turn Palestine into the land of Israel. That's the overall goal. And what I would argue is that it's done. In other words, we talk, we talk about conquest 
in Zionism. Even though it belongs to us, we still conquer it. Joshua conquered as well. So it's a word that, that's, that's acceptable. So we conquered the West Bank and Gaza in 1967, not with the intention of giving it back. This was the last stage of a century-long process of Judaization. And so, you see, the problem with the word occupation, I mean, I say it's not a conflict, but I also say there's no occupation. I think we shouldn't use that word. Because occupation, now, it's true, it is an occupation in international law. It's certainly an occupation if you're a Palestinian. But the word occupation uh, implies an external territory. It's outside of Israel. You have Israel proper, and then you have the occupied territory, that bifurcation. And in all the negotiations, of course, Israel's fine. We're not negotiating anything about the 78%. That's outside of negotiations. We're talking about the 22% that is so-called occupied, with the, with the idea that somehow that's outside, that can be detached. It, that Israel would actually be willing to turn that into a Palestinian state. But it's not true. That was never, ever, ever the intention of Israel. In fact, Israel has never recognized the existence of a Palestinian people, let alone its collective rights. In the brightest days of Oslo, 1993, um, you know, Rabin demanded of Arafat that he write a letter and actually, he wrote a very moving letter. You should look it up. Not only recognizing the state of Israel, but recognizing it as a legitimate construct. Nothing grudging. He had to genuinely, wholeheartedly accept the idea of Israel as a Jewish state, which he did. Much to Edward Said's consternation, but he did. In return, Israel did not recognize the Palestinian people and their rights. All Israel did in Oslo was to recognize the PLO as a negotiating partner. That's it. With an open-ended negotiation, it had no goal. Arafat would sometimes say, we're negotiating a two-state solution. Rabin would correct him and say, no, we're not. Maybe, who knows, maybe that'll emerge. We have no idea where the negotiations are going. And that's, of course, why they failed, because you know, when Oslo began, there were 200,000 Israeli settlers in what's called the occupied territory. By the time it ended seven years later, in the year 2000, there were 400,000 settlers. Today, there's almost 800,000 Israelis living in the Palestinian, what we would consider an occupied Palestinian territory. So what I'm saying is there was never any pause in in the, in the process of Judaizing the entire country. There was, never, there was never a pause even. No one ever really thought about it. And what I would argue is it's done. In other words, in other words uh, uh, it's finished, um, the process of Judaization. And I would argue that the, uh, the West Bank is Judea and Samaria today. It's an integral part of, of Israel. There is no more Israel proper and an occupied territory to detach. And that's a problem with BDS. You know, one of the, L BDS still reflects the two-state idea. It hasn't been updated, and that's a real problem. We've always supported BDS, the boycotts, divestment, sanctions movement. But one of the elements is, and the occupation, that I would argue is a diversion, because it is ended, <laughs> and there never was an occupation. And the other element is equal rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel. So here you've got that Israel occupation by dichotomy that we have to do away with, I think. So BDS has to be rethought and reformulated in light of a new analysis and in light of, I think, the one state program that I want to present. So in case you still didn't get the point, <laughs> Israel, um, imposed over the occupied territory what I call a matrix of control. 
In other words, in case you still didn't get it, that it's not Palestinian, it's ours, we're going to keep it. Um, we simply created what we call facts on the ground that are so massive and so permanent that it makes Israeli control irreversible. You know, so, you know, again, you've got about uh, 800,000 Israelis living in these blue blotches, about 200. We talk about settlements, but that's the wrong word. You think of a settlement, you know, you think of somewhere in Wyoming, you know, a couple huts on a hillside. But settlements in Israel are really cities. Male Adumim is about 50,000 people. Upper Modi'in here is about 80,000 people. Neve Yaakov, Pisgat Ze'ev in northern Jerusalem is 120,000 people. And they're being consolidated, these settlements, into these pink areas that Israel calls settlement blocks. So we're in the process of consolidating major urban areas that are linked into the urban areas of Israel itself with a whole uh, a system of major highways, some of them for Israelis only. One of them was just opened a couple of weeks ago with a wall down the middle where Palestinians drive on one side and Israelis drive on the other side that again incorporate this into Israel. Um, the Palestinians, I mean, I'm, maybe I'm, I'm talking to an audience that knows, so bear with me if I'm repeating, but the Palestinians are then confined, about 95% of them, to areas A and B, and Gaza, which is a cage. Well, A and B, areas A and B in Gaza represent 40% of the occupied territory. So let's put it in this kind of a perspective. The occupied territory is an area about the size of Rhode Island. Not the biggest state in the Union. And the Palestinians are confined to 40% of Rhode Island. Okay? And then areas A, B, and Gaza are shattered into about 164 separate islands. You know, it isn't like 40% as one block. There's 164 islands, all surrounded by settlements, highways, checkpoints, the wall, and so on. So think of Rhode Island, where you have a population of about 5 million people stuck in 164 islands on 40% of Rhode Island, and you begin to get an understanding of how unviable and how far we are from any possibility of a two-state solution. I mean, it's simply gone and long gone. And I think we should stop talking about it. Because the more you keep talking about an irrelevant solution, you're simply muddying the waters. And let me say, it's just cute. Because we get American news in Israel that you don't really get. It's a different perspective. You know, in 2014, uh, in, you know, the Obama administration sent Kerry here, the Secretary of State John Kerry, not here, to uh, Israel-Palestine to try a, a last-ditch effort to salvage the two-state solution. And they really tried. I mean, it was genuine. In one of his visits, Kerry came with 320 advisors. Now, what you do with 320 advisors, I have no idea. And it failed. And the chief negotiator was Martin Indyk, who was the head of APAC. And he said, it's because of Israel that it failed. That's the degree to which it was clear. But this is what I want to get at. Let's end this talk of a two-state solution. And the best term to end it, the most definitive, was Kerry's. So Kerry, after this whole thing collapses, is testifying in front of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And he says, and I'm almost quoting, look it up on the internet, fact check me. <laughs> He's saying to the senators, well, you know, so we're sitting down and we've started to finalize an agenda and the issues, the final status issues and all of a sudden, Israel announces the building of 5,000 housing units in the West Bank. 
and poof, poof. That's what he's, but that's what Kerry said, poof. Now there's no post poof. <laughs> poof is it. There's nothing after poof. And the good part about poof as well is that it clears the air, poof. Now finally we can dispel this fog of a two-state solution that was always getting in the way. Every time you wanted to think of another way to go, the two-state solution would get in the way. Poof, it's gone. Now we can begin to see, see clearly. And that's what I want to focus on uh, tonight. So, the two-state solution is not only gone, but it never was. And even if you think it was, <laughs> it's gone. Which means then, not only is the two-state solution gone, but Israel, and this is really important, the framing, um, because one of the ways Israel gets away with this is that Israel presents itself as a victim. We're the victim, always, you see? We might be the sixth largest uh, uh, arms exporter and an uh, occupying power for 50 years, but we're the, we're the, we're the victim. So the framing is important. We have to say Israel eliminated the two-state solution. It wasn't the Palestinians. Abu Mazen would sign on it tomorrow morning if he could. Which means then that it's Israel that has de facto already created a single state. There is one state today. The whole argument, two states, one state, is over. There's one functional de facto country between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. You can't get into this country without going through Israeli border controls. There's one effective government here. Don't tell me it's the PA. There's one army, obviously. There's one currency. There's one infrastructure. By any measure, this is already one country, right? And it's an apartheid country. It's an apartheid state because, because is one country ruled by one governing power that has three separate legal regimes. You have one legal regime for Israeli Jewish citizens of the country. You have a second legal regime for non-Jewish citizens of the country. And that's what this whole Jewish nationalities law was about a couple months ago. And you have a third legal system for the non-Jewish Palestinian citizens of the occupied territory. So, so apartheid simply means separation. That's what apart means. Separateness. You just, again, look at the Israeli flag and you can see that one population has separated itself from the others. And then that population creates a permanent institutionalized regime of domination. It's not Jim Crow, discrimination. You have that everywhere. It's the regime, it's the laws, it's the concept of the country, of the state. And that's an apartheid system. So I would say the two-state solution we could have lived with. Again, both the Palestinians and the Israeli peace movement accepted it. We weren't against it, but it, w it never was and it's gone. So the one state that exists today, which is an apartheid state, obviously is not acceptable, hopefully to any of us, which seems to me almost mathematically to leave one option still possible. And that is, and again, the framing is important, to transform the single state, the apartheid state that Israel created into a democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. Which shouldn't be such a shocking <laughs> idea for Americans. A democracy. And that's basically what we're talking about. Transforming an apartheid regime, and we can show and prove that it's an apartheid regime, into a democratic state of equal rights. So that's what we're, what we're talking about. Now, let me just go on for another couple minutes if I may, because it's, an, it's a good idea. And in fact, the one state has been in the air for a long time. But what we've been trying to do over the last year and a half 
is to really nail down what do we mean? What would it look like? How would it function? Um, and, I, and I'll be honest, we, you know, we put a lot of work into it. Any of us could have sat down for five minutes and written up a plan that us leftists would love. I can do that. Me and my five friends, we'd have a great plan. But we said to ourselves, we want to formulate a program that we can genuinely take forward into the political arena. You know, we want to be political actors. So we had to bite a few bullets. And we had to address all the different parties. So let me just, we have a 10 point plan that you have. Let me just very quickly talk about four points. I promise quickly. And our plan divides up into two parts. One is decolonization, because we're not talking about a conflict. So we're not talking about some technical solution. The border is here, we do a territorial swap, we move a few people around, and we have a solution. We have to decolonize the country in a fundamental way. So we have decolonization leading to a post-colonial situation. So first of all, we're talking about a single constitutional democracy. A country with a constitution that Israel doesn't have today. Israel is the only country in the world, except Britain, that has the Magna Carta, um, that doesn't have a constitution. And the big, I think the major revolution of what we're talking about is that this country would, be, would belong to all its citizens. I mean, that's the American model. That's a Western European model of a democracy. That's not the way Zionism and Israel was, was ever conceived, or the two-state solution. Those are all conceived on an ethnic, national, religious basis. And so you had to somehow let those, those collective units determine. Our revolution is no. There's got to be a country that's based on all its citizens, and every citizen has equal rights. So the second uh, element is, of course, the right of return. Every Palestinian refugee ha and, and their descendants have the right to return to the country. And this isn't only a right or a moral issue, but it makes sense. If you're, doing a, if you're thinking about a project that's based on the citizenry, Refugees are a part of your citizenry. The fact that they've been driven out or they fled does not change their civil status. They're still part of your citizenry, even if they're not physically in the country. So by allowing Palestinian refugees and their descendants to come back, in a sense, we're simply extending the idea of citizenship to everyone. Now, some people say, well, what about Jews? Well, it's interesting because this would apply to Jewish refugees from the country. If Jews were refugees from Palestine, yes, they could come back as well. There aren't any. <laughs> and so in a sense, it applies to Palestinians coming back, not because it's discriminatory, but simply because there aren't Jewish refugees um, from the country that are part of the citizenry. Now, if Jews from New York <laughs> want to come live in the country, since you're not citizens. In other words, you're changing this. Just because you're Jewish doesn't make you automatically the citizen of another country. So if Jews want to live in the country, fine, you can come as immigrants, and there's a, there'll be a naturalization process. And what's significant is, it's true for Palestinians as well. You have, for example, large Palestinian populations in Latin America that got there in the 1920s. Matter of fact, the fellow who was just elected president of El Salvador is of Palestinian background. Well, those aren't refugees either. They're not refugees. So if a Palestinian from Chile wants to come live in our country, he or she would also have to go through a naturalization process. So admit, there's a logic to it that makes sense in a civil society kind of a way why you would give that right to Palestinian refugees and their descendants and not, and not to others. And of course, we also need land redistribution and financial compensations 
and affirmative discrimination, affirmative action, and so on, in order to reintegrate them into society. The third piece that I already mentioned, and I don't have to get into it, is individual rights. One citizenship, one parliament, one person, one vote, equal individual rights. Now, having said what I just said, this is the part that's the most, the most contentious. And that is that, yes, individual rights uh, in, uh, in a democracy. But this isn't Kansas. <laughs> you know, this isn't just a place where we're all a bunch of voters. Um, but very important and fundamental national collective identities, ethnic identities, religious identities, tribal identities have preceded the state. The state is a new construct in the Middle East, a European imposition. So we have to recognize that. And so the, the bridging that we found that would work is the idea of collective rights. In other words, that everyone, uh, in, or the Constitution would protect the collective rights of all the different collectivities in the, in the society. You have a right to your language, you have a right to your identity, Nobody's going to close the Hebrew University. Um, and that, of course, is important as well. This is what I mean by biting bullets, because the Israeli Jews are going to be the minority. Well, they're not stupid. <laughs> you know, and what the, the first thing they ask is, what's going to prevent the Palestinian majority from doing to us what we do to them today? The tyranny of the majority. They're already a minority. There's a Palestinian majority in the country today, demographically speaking. I mean, it's about 50-50, but it's edging, and even the Israeli uh, Bureau of Census says this, it's, it's edging into a Palestinian majority. And then if you get refugees coming back, even if it's only some of the refugees, there'll be a Palestinian majority. So all this says to, it, it provides a safety net. It doesn't give you any privileges. It doesn't allow you to leverage anything into domination. It simply says, relax. You can keep your identity, you can keep your language, you keep your association within a multicultural society. Just like the United States. I mean, you have Amish, you have Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn that are, have their own, you do that. You don't have to say that here because the dynamic was that people came uh, and, and they were allowed to have the freedom of association and so on. Here we've got to really say it because the collective groups have preceded uh, this state. Um, and that's basically, I think this is really important, but it doesn't give anybody any privileges. It simply recognizes the fact that this is a multicultural society and actually, what's interesting is it's not only Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. We have 40,000 African asylum seekers in the country. They're not leaving. Israel is not able to get rid of them because of international laws to protect asylum seekers. Well, that's the nucleus of a major community. You've got the children of foreign workers. There's 350,000 foreign workers in Israel. Well, they leave, but you know, they don't all leave. And they leave behind kids and relationships and this and that. A quarter of the kids in first grade in Tel Aviv are what you would call illegal immigrants today. Uh, and then you've got 150,000 to 200,000 Russian, Russians who are Israeli citizens who are not Jewish and don't want to be Jewish. They're, they call themselves ethnic Russians. And uh, so in other words, the society is much, uh, plus all kinds of other ethnic groups, as Bedouins and Circassians and Druze and, um, and? No, Christians and Muslims. And I mean, there's all kinds of communities. Where did the Russians come from? Why did they come? The Russians came, you know, in the, after 89. Uh, you know, some of them were married to Jews or uh, Israel wanted very much Russians to come. They were coming to the United States. And so Israel pressed Bush the father, and he closed, he closed the United States to Russians after quite a few came. And then they went to Germany. 
And so Israel pressed Schroeder, who was the chancellor then, and, they, and Germany closed up after loading up with Russian, you know, most of the Jews in Germany today are, are Russian. Uh, they closed, and so Russians were forced to come to Israel. The Russians who are not Jews um, fall into the Jewish category from the point of view of where they, they live with Israeli Jews. Um, they go to the army. There's a whole process that makes it very easy for them to convert if they want to. Uh, but on the other hand, um, they're not Jews. They can't marry with other Jews because you don't have civil marriage in Israel. And uh, I just, uh, all right, a little tiny story. I, I, I'm going on too long. But in, uh, in Carmiel is a large city in the north, in the Galilee. It has a big ethnic Russian population. Well, it, I mean, just to show you how they're kind of caught in between, they're Russian Orthodox Christians. Well, so they, they go to church in the, uh, in the Russian or Greek Orthodox churches in the Palestinian communities, because that's where the churches are. But they're right-wing Israelis, and they don't like to go pray with Arabs. So they want to build a church of their own in Carmiel. And the Jews are saying, what? You're going to build a church in our community? Are you crazy? So, you know, they're just, you know, they're caught in this ethnocracy by not being one or the other. What I'm saying is the country is actually much more pluralistic than, than we would think. The last thing I want to say, all right, we've talked about dismantling the structures of domination. Basically, our vision is, and this is what collective rights allows you to do as well, to construct a new civil society. We'll all be living together. There'll be civil marriage. There'll be integrated communities, integrated schools. You know, we're sharing a political system. And over two, three, four generations, a new civil society will emerge. We don't have it today. We don't even have today the name of the country. You know, you had in South Africa, remember Mandela could say before the end of apartheid. The ANC could say we're all South Africans. The idea was that it was inclusive. We can't say we're all anything. We, there is no overarching civil identity or civil society. That has to emerge. I think the name of the country has to emerge. This is, in a sense, what we're looking to create. You know, one uh, multicultural democracy, Again, one citizenship, uh, equal rights, uh, based on a shared civil society, a shared civil identity that will, that will emerge. In, in the beginning, it won't attract everybody, obviously. It'll attract younger people, more secular people, middle class people. Um, you know, refugees coming back want to come back as Palestinians to Palestine, and that's understandable. And they should be able to do that. They need that space. They have no concept of what a civil society means. Very few people do. As a matter of fact, in the Middle East, the whole concept of a civil society is, is, is not very common. Um, so that, you know, over time, the idea is that the shared civil society will emerge and grow stronger. I'll give you one cute example of what I mean by, by a civil society emerging. In the rest of the world, outside the United States, football is not the NFL. Football is what you call soccer. And the World Football Association is called FIFA. And in, in FIFA, in the FIFA standings, the Palestinian national football team is ranked higher than the Israeli national football team. So neither one have managed to break into the World Cup which is a huge deal. It's like the Super Bowl times 100. Croatia was discovered as a country when it came in number two in the World Cup. You know, I mean, it's a huge thing. So can you imagine if our teams come together that we manage to get into the World Cup? That's precisely that kind of shared experience that, is, that builds nations or builds civil societies. But at any rate, we still have room and space for people that prefer to remain Palestinian more, 
or Israeli more, and then over time decide, decide where they want to go. So that's, that's the plan. Let me say one more word about how we get there. Just a word about strategy, because it's a nice idea, and I think we fleshed it out not badly, but <laughs> how, how would we possibly get to a thing like that? And I think we're we still have to talk about that a lot more. And all this has to be fleshed out. But we're taking a, a leaf from the playbook of South Africa. Because South Africa, in a way, was in the same situation. You know, the ANC knew that the, most of the whites in South Africa were not going to support the end of apartheid. They weren't going to be partners. So the ANC had a strategy of creating an alliance with the international civil society. Churches, um, a lot of us were involved with that, labor unions, all kinds of groups, in order to, in the end, and, and then using BDS and using boycotts in all kinds of ways, isolating South Africa to make apartheid unsustainable. That's, I think, what we have to try to do here. Palestinians um, have to create an alliance with the international civil society. Not governments, because governments aren't on our side right now. You know, um, so that with critical Israelis being involved, that I think is important, the Palestinians create this alliance, and the international civil society works to change its government policy. So today, for example, the US campaign, which is now called the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, focuses on American policy in all kinds of ways, but they don't have an ask. There's no, there's no, in other words, if you go into a congressperson's office and they say, what do you want? We don't have an answer. And they don't have an answer. But we want the end of house demolitions, we want the end of occupation, we want the end of this, but it, we don't have a political concept. So that's what we're trying to do. The infrastructure is there. You're all here. The US campaign is here. JVP is on board, Code Pink. Sabil, um, many organizations uh, are on board, Palestine Solidarity Groups Abroad. I did a tour last year of Iceland, the Faroe Islands, and Tromsø, Norway, which is above the Arctic Circle, in February, <laughs> my winter tour. <laughs> you know, each of those places has a vibrant Palestine Solidarity Committee. I think the Palestinian issue has reached the proportions of the anti-apartheid struggle. But we don't have an end game, and so we're, we're stuck. We're stuck. And so if we, the stakeholders, this is a Palestinian-led movement, you have some of the names, supported by critical Israelis, if, if we can insert that end game, that gives focus and direction to all your efforts. You keep doing what you're doing, which is important, but now you've got an ask or a demand or a program that you, that, you know, that you can bring forward into the political arena. The idea being, again, to create pressures that make Israeli apartheid unsustainable in the end. So I'll leave it at that. Okay. <clears throat>